Pharmacy resident burnout is less understood than that of resident physicians. However, there are a couple things that we do know from the limited research that we have. The first is that residents are put in high stress situations that put them at risk for burnout. The second is that pharmacy residents frequently experience burnout during their training. And so in today's video, I'm going to be reviewing an article published in the American Journal of Health System Pharmacist called When Resiliency is Not Enough, Addressing the Structure of a Residency Program and Its Contribution to Pharmacy Resident Burnout. I will also be reviewing two additional letters that were written in discussing this article, and that's where things get a little bit interesting. So if you want access to the full articles that I am reviewing today, they are behind a paywall. But if you are a member of the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, or ASHP, then you are going to be able to access them. If you aren't, you may be able to access them through your employer or your school online library where you attend or precept. So I'm going to leave links to all of the articles down below, and they will also be in the full show notes, which you can find at happyfarmlife.com forward slash resources forward slash HPL 107. With that out of the way, let's dive into the article a little bit. So this was written for the New Practitioner Forum's column of AJHP, and this is not a research article, but rather this is a case study of what a residency program did at a small community hospital by implementing a burnout and well-being monitoring program. Now, before diving into how this program exactly worked, I wanted to hit a few of the highlights from their background section that I thought were interesting. What they mention is that ASHP is putting more emphasis on education related to burnout with their new standards for PGY-1 residencies. And if you want to be accredited, you have to go through ASHP's accreditation standards. And so there are a couple different points that bring up these standards now. So standard 3.3b, which I'm going to have all of the standards linked down below if you're interested in reading like what the current residency standards are for PGY-1s. But this is regarding the need to orient residents to the program, and that includes teaching them about their burnout resources. Now, note here for all of these standards that I'm going to mention, this is listed as a consideration to teach rather than a requirement. And I'm going to go into that more, but I just wanted to point it out. The next standard that it talks about this is preceptor development, and that is standard 4.4e. And lastly, standard 6.4H is about the pharmacy staff, all staff that work there, getting information and understanding well-being and burnout education and their resources available to them. So going back to the fact that this is a consideration, it's not a requirement. So if programs choose not to implement giving any of this education to their residents, they will not suffer any consequences from ASHP as far as like losing their accreditation. They will still get accredited. It won't be docked. It may be mentioned that, you know, you should do this or we would recommend that you do this, but it is not something that's going to make or break a residency program, which means it's less likely for it to get implemented widely across the board, at least initially. But the other reason I think that it being a consideration is actually a good thing is there is a lot of evidence to say when you require training around resiliency, burnout, and well-being, and it's, like I said, mandatory required, you have to do it if you're going to be a preceptor or be a resident there, there is a lot of resentment that can come with that, and it can actually worsen burnout and potentially lead to people feeling a little cynical towards that, especially if they're not in a place where they're willing to accept the education that they are receiving, for example. So it is interesting to note that there were some programs mentioned in this article that developed like nine session resiliency courses for their residents to go through. Didn't say if it was required or not, but if that was a requirement, is that actually helping burnout? Is it worsening burnout? I'm not sure how open to these types of trainings are residents. Those are all questions that kind of come up here, but it is nice to see that it is at least mentioned that resident well-being and burnout need to be addressed within these residency programs because prior to these standards, it was not mentioned at all. The last point I want to hit before moving into the case study is that pharmacy residents are an inherently resilient group of individuals. They have worked incredibly hard to get where they are. They have had to get a doctorate and they had to do more work above and beyond to stand out among their peers that also have doctorate degrees 
that means they were doing additional work. They were often working in a pharmacy. They were doing research. They were taking on leadership positions. And all of those things mean they have had to build good enough coping strategies to get through that in order to go through residency and get matched amongst their peers. This is not a group of individuals that is missing grit and drive, but a lot of the conversations that are had about residency burnout is focused on building the resiliency of the resident, which I think you can always work on building resiliency. But on the other end of this, we are not addressing the things that are causing these residents to be burned out in the first place. With that said, let's review a case study that is actually looking at how we're going to implement some of these changes to help resident burnout. The burnout monitoring system that was created by this program was a three-step model. Step one was orientation, step two was monitoring, and step three was a continuous quality improvement. Now in the orientation phase, this is where the burnout assessment was done using a validated method. In the article, they talk about the different validated methods. I'm not going to go into that today because it's a pretty in-depth discussion on which one to use. There are pros and cons of the different tools. So if you're reading the actual article, you can check those out. But another thing that they mentioned was how the results are going to be used and making sure that the residents know that. And I would say a big concern from the perspective of a resident is the perception of how they will be viewed by their colleagues, their preceptors, their RPD after taking something like this, not just now, but We'll talk about the monitoring continuous phase where they do this again. And you want to make sure that there's not any punitive action that could be tied to doing a burnout survey like this. The other thing to think about here is these are going to be people who are writing letters of recommendation. And so are they going to be able to use any of the information from this survey when evaluating how to write a letter? And I think you can say no, but there's also that in the back of your head bias that may come in. So I do think it's important to know where residents are, and I don't know of a better way at this time to evaluate burnout and stress without using such a validated measure. But there definitely are concerns on how this information will be used, especially from the resident perspective that may make it likely that the results might not be fully accurate. In the monitoring phase of this model, the assessment is repeated to see if there is a difference that occurred over time. And while this sounds simple and obvious that you would need to do this, there's actually a few factors to consider here that I think are important, and the author brought up several of these. So the efficacy of these burnout surveys that are validated for burnout itself aren't validated for short periods of time to see change. So some of them are evaluated for a year. Some of them don't have an evaluation on how long you need to wait. Some of them are six months. And so that can be a concern to see, can you actually see a change in burnout over time if you're doing these very frequently? One of the things mentioned was every single rotation, which I think is very excessive because then you start getting this survey fatigue, especially for longer surveys. Some of these surveys have only nine questions, but some of them have up to 22. And so if you're doing these long surveys at the end of every rotation on top of the evaluations, on top of other surveys you're doing on your preceptor, it can just become a lot. On the flip side of that, if you do not do these surveys often enough, then the program may not be able to see the change that they are needing to, to know where problems are occurring and what changes need to be made. Another important point that was brought up here that I thought of was that external factors can change the results that have nothing to do with the program itself. So you can have a sick loved one or a loved one pass away, personal health issues, health issues of a family member. You know, there are a lot of other external factors that can play into this, including financial needs that may be difficult to have a conversation with the resident about because they're very personal and you want to monitor burnout and help them, but there are also things that you can't control as a residency program director or considering they're essentially you're the boss and they're an employee, that relationship is still there. And so navigating that, especially in these short periods of time, could be difficult. So step three of this is continuous quality improvement. And that's the whole point of doing this. Once you get your results, you're going to have a meeting with the resident and discuss the results and discuss maybe what is leading to them if they're seeing a change that is negative or positive. Why is your burnout score improving over time? Why did it decrease? What can we do in the future to help prevent this from happening to other residents if it is going in the wrong direction? And you want to make sure this discussion is reflective in a positive manner. Again, you don't want it to be punitive. 
And it requires balance of helping the resident, but again, not digging into those personal life factors too much because you are still maintaining that employer or manager and employee relationship. But here are a few things that this program found doing this type of monitoring, and they did not say how frequently they were doing this. I don't think so. I didn't remember seeing that, but some of the learning experiences came with a more emotional toll and that letter led to higher levels of burnout. So they mentioned oncology in this letter specifically or this article specifically, but one of the worst for me was actually my ER staffing experience. I saw a lot of very traumatic things. I was working in a pediatric emergency room staffing every other weekend. I saw some really horrible things and I felt very alone in that because I just did not know how to handle every single weekend that I came into work watching somebody lose their child. And here's the crazy thing. My co-resident who was working the opposite weekend of me wasn't seeing anything. So it was just kind of luck of the draw that I just kept having it happen over and over and over again. And one weekend we had multiple patients pass and it was really difficult for me because I was just like, holy cow, is this what pediatrics is? Because comparing it to what I'd done before, which was working at a different hospital that was much smaller, we didn't have that kind of death toll coming through. And I actually found out later on, one of those days, the day that we had multiple pass away in one day, the director of the emergency department was working and he wrote an article about that night and how terrible that shift was for him. And he'd been doing it for 20 years. So I learned from that experience that I was not alone in having difficulty coping with that. It did affect how I was performing during my work week because I was still trying to deal with the things that I was seeing during my staffing weekends when I was going into my other rotations during the week. I do think that the emotional toll that not just a rotation, but maybe the staffing experiences are playing is something to consider when discussing burnout with residents. Another thing that they found in this particular article was that their 12-day work week was a huge stressor to their residents. So they moved things around to where residents could have Sundays off and they moved some of those hours to a week day evening shift. I think this is a very interesting thought process because I did 12 days on two days off and it was pretty brutal. It wears on you over time, having that limited amount of time off, especially when it's hard to like do your normal task and like grocery shopping, those errands that you have to run when you have a situation like this. I feel for the residents that were saying this leads to burnout. This last one was interesting to me because I hadn't thought about it before, but one of the things that brought a lot of stress up around November, which for me, November, I'm thinking mid-year and planning your life. But another thing that fell then was that is when a lot of the residents were having to set up their student loan repayments because they were going to go out of that grace period right in the next couple of months. And so they were trying to set everything up. And let's just be honest, like the student loan setup is difficult to navigate. And so they were having trouble with that. And that was one of the things that was brought up to the attention of the program that they were struggling with. So they created educational programs around student loans to help them, even though that is not the responsibility of the residency program. It's something that they could do to relieve some of the stress burden on their residents. In the article's closing, there were a couple of quotes that I really liked that I want to read to you and discuss. So the first was, Preventing burnout does not mean that residency cannot be challenging, but challenges can occur within a structure that allows trainees to grow and learn without losing their passion for pharmacy. And as a preceptor, I wholeheartedly agree. I precept students and I precept residents. We need to challenge them. We need to challenge learners. If you are a student and a resident and you're not being challenged on rotations, you are wasting your time and money. If you're a student, you are paying tens of thousands of dollars to go on rotations. And if I, as a preceptor, am not challenging you, you could go somewhere else and work for a lot more and not be paying money to do that. So as a preceptor, I want to challenge you. I want you to walk away with learnings that you would not have otherwise. Same thing goes with residents, except you're not paying money to be there, but you have a opportunity cost, right? You are looking for more education to have more learning, more opportunities for a job you want, but it comes at the cost that you are not getting paid a pharmacist's full salary. You are getting paid, yes, 
but you're not getting paid as much, especially for the hours that you work. So you want to make sure that you're going to a program that is going to push you and challenge you and help you learn as much as possible. A residency program should push you to be uncomfortable because in those uncomfortable moments, that is where you learn how to be a really good pharmacist. That is where you learn the skills that you need when somebody is in a critical situation, potentially dying, and the physician looks at you and asks for a recommendation, asks for a dose. Those uncomfortable moments that you have in residency prepare you to answer those questions when it is actually truly life or death. Because I have been in those moments where I have been asked a dose or asked a question by a physician, and we are in the middle of a code. That is something that can happen when you are going to go into a hospital position. And you may not be in a life or death situation, but those programs can still set you up to answer questions and build respect with your physicians and help better patient care, no matter what you're going into and doing a residency for. But if residents leave their residency program hating the profession, we have done something wrong and we have failed them. These are incredibly passionate individuals. They're choosing to do a residency because they want to learn more. They want to grow. And if we are not giving them the increased love and passion for the profession and the specialty that they're wanting to go into, if they are specializing in a PGY2, I think we truly are failing them as educators because there should be a balance between pushing somebody and challenging them and then pushing them over the edge to where they hate the profession completely. And I'm not going to lie. I don't know exactly where that balance line is. And I think things like this assessment program can help find the line and find what some of the tipping points are and the stressors that maybe aren't thought about on a regular basis when we're discussing pharmacy residency, resiliency, and burnout. The second quote I wanted to read you was this, Residency is a time for recent graduates to practice for their future careers. If their practice environment involves copious amounts of stress and burnout, there is limited likelihood that these habits will translate into a sustainable post-residency practice. So let me know if you guys know somebody, and it could be yourself because I was definitely guilty of this for a while, that post-residency was taking on more hours than they should, had their email on their phone and was answering it all hours of the night. We're basically treating practice like they did when they were a resident, taking on additional projects, trying to do more than what is asked of them all of the time, staying late, picking up extra shifts, working on those long hours, doing work at home, those same things that you frequently have to do as a resident to get through. You may not have to work from home, depending on what's best for you. you I did a lot because my desk at home was a more enjoyable environment than my desk at work, but you get the point. Resident habits become pharmacist habits once they step into that pharmacist role. And it is hard to have a clear cut. You don't just flip a switch and become somebody who is good at building boundaries, who is good at setting positive habits to keep you from burnout if you have not set any of those in place before. I do agree that you're going to have some bad habits leaving residency. Part of it is you're doing a lot more than you're going to do on your day-to-day -day practice. But how can we set residents up for success so they have built some of those habits and at least know what kind of habits they need to build moving forward? So when they are stepping out of residency, they're not like, how do I function as a pharmacist, not a resident? I think no matter what we do, this transition is going to be hard, but how can we do a little bit better to make that transition smoother? The article I just reviewed was from June 2021, and then in February 2022, there was a letter written in response to this that was titled, Addressing Stress and Burnout in Pharmacy Residents, But at What Cost? I was not surprised to see something like this was written in response to an article that talks about changing staffing to help accommodate resident burnout or even surveying residency burnout. Because when you talk about mitigating burnout in residents, there is always the discussion of, well, what about their education? How can we do this without diminishing the education that we're giving them? We don't want to take away any of the experience because they're spending so much time doing this. And that was a theme across this letter. The concern of we don't want to make residency too easy and take away from the educational experience by taking away some of the things that are causing the stress because they're good educational opportunities. I'm going to refer to this letter as the reply letter because there was a second letter that was titled Opportunity Cost that was written by the original authors in response to this reply letter. The first point I want to talk about from the reply letter is they say that burnout is a chronic workplace stress syndrome that is 
partly due to a lack of resources. And this is very true. That's part of how it is defined by the World Health Organization. But they say that the limited resources that the residents have is likely knowledge and skills. And those are the reasons why residents are maybe more prone to burnout. Now, it is true that residents compared to their preceptors likely lack a lot of knowledge and skills. That's why they're there. They're there to learn. And I can tell you being in an environment where you have less knowledge and skills than the person that they are normally used to having, the medical team is used to having your preceptor and you are there as the resident and you don't have those same skills yet. You're working on building them. It can be very intimidating. It can be very stressful because they're going to ask you questions that you do not know how they answer to and your preceptor would and you're going to have to look them up. However, the team knows this most of the time. They are aware you are a learner and it is more stressful to you than it is on the other side for sure. These same stressful situations, though, are great learning opportunities for residents, and they do help you grow. And this is personal, no research backed by this, but I feel like those stressful situations were more positive stress than negative stress because I felt like I was helping. I was doing patient care. That is what I was there to do. And so when I came back with an answer, not only did I learn something, but I learned something that is helping a human being now and likely a human being that I will take care of in the future. And that makes that type of stress worth it to me and positive because there are good stressors and there are bad stressors and there are amount of stress where you hit the tipping point. Positive stress challenges you without making you feel diminished. In the original article letter, they did bring up a really good point that factors such as increased autonomy, flexibility, and sense of control are shown to be protective against burnout. So if the lack of knowledge and skills is what is driving a lot of the burnout for residents, having more people there to support them, more oversight would be something that would be positive. But the research has shown that that is actually negative because if you think about it, these are fully licensed pharmacists that are going through residency. And It is very well documented in the literature on a variety of levels. If you require more tasks, you take away control and more people get burned out. We've seen this with increased regulatory burdens throughout the healthcare system over the years, requiring more documentation than before. And it's also been seen in studying pharmacists with what their requirements are and the lack of autonomy they have, the more stiff their schedule is, the more tasks that they're required to do that they don't have a lot of say-so on or autonomy with, the more likely they are to be burned out. And so I mentioned that residents are fully licensed pharmacists. And the other component of knowing that they're fully licensed pharmacists is that these pharmacists could go into a staffing role directly out of pharmacy school. They could get a hospital job without going through residency, but they've chosen to do additional training. And so thinking that they don't have the knowledge and skills to work as a hospital pharmacist, yes, maybe they don't have the knowledge and skills to be a clinical pharmacist specialist rounding with the team right out of pharmacy school. I don't think anybody really has that. Some people do land those roles and it does happen. But I think, you know, bringing up the point that They have enough knowledge and skills to get hired into those roles. So maybe lacking knowledge and skills isn't the main driver of burnout. I'm sure that it adds additional stress. I can personally say it added additional stress for me, but that may not be the primary way or means to address when we're looking at resident burnout. So the second point I wanted to bring up is that the reply letter mentioned that there needs to be a clear distinction between stress and burnout. In one sense, there is, and in another sense, there isn't. Burnout is more than stress. It's more than acute stress. And a lot of the scoring systems bring that into account. It talks about the amount of time that you have experienced symptoms in some of the questions in these burnout survey questionnaires. And I think oftentimes we dismiss residents as being burned out because of the word chronic. And that's the time frame that is not defined. What is chronic stress? How long does it have to be before it's chronic? So for example, with depression, we have definitive times where these symptoms have to be present for this long before we classify it as depression. So if you've only experienced it short term, it's acute after a certain amount of time. Now we can classify you as depressed. That's not how burnout works. There is no specific time frame. But the other thing that sometimes with something like chronic, it gets to miss is they're like, well, residency is only one or two years. It is more stress than you're normally going to have. So is it really burnout? But I think we oftentimes forget 
that these students, most of them are coming in with work experience, several years of work experience. For me, I was a technician before I started pharmacy school and I was doing that part-time, but I had some experience in a pharmacy there. And then when I was an intern, I was working 16 to 24 hours a week, not necessarily the amount of time I would recommend, but that's what I was doing. And I was working a lot and I was in a pharmacy a lot. So that was on top of the work that I was doing as a student. Residents can come in to residency having underlying stress, having been stressed out for a long period of time that you're building off of what is already there rather than saying that burnout is a new thing and we're starting fresh with residency because that's oftentimes not the case. So no, there's not a definitive line, but there is a little bit more to it where there are specific things that are manifesting because of that stress, that emotional exhaustion that is happening, that cynicism, as well as that decreased efficiency. Those things don't happen overnight and they don't all happen at once when you're just acutely stressed. So keeping that in mind and really understanding the definition of burnout will probably help with, is this stress, is this burnout? And also remembering if we have a resident, we should not be trying to diagnose them with burnout because that is not our job. And point three that I wanted to talk about was the discussion back and forth of what should be added to a program or taken away from a program in order to mitigate burnout. Duty hours and staffing requirements were something I brought up before, but I'm bringing it up again because this is something that always comes up in the discussion of educating resident and mitigating burnout because you are asking residents frequently to work 60 plus hours. The main theme that I have found with this discussion was there are no set requirements for how many hours a pharmacy resident should staff. And as far as I'm aware, there's not any information out there about what is the best method, because I think balancing having the experience where you're staffing enough that you are doing it frequently enough that you're able to build on those skills, but also not doing it so much that you are burning out the resident by adding many additional hours that aren't necessarily adding significant amounts of learning. It's interesting to see how different programs do their staffing because there are a lot of different methods out there that I have seen, but I really haven't seen them compared to one another necessarily. I did staffing working at the hospital every other weekend, and then we also did one evening shift every other week. And it was a lot of hours, especially compared to my colleagues that were at programs that just did staffing every third weekend, and sometimes they even got a comp day. And so looking at the vast differences in the number of hours, especially when you think of the course of an entire year, how many more hours some programs have their residents doing than others, there are also programs that use residents in times where there are call-ins or short staffing, and there are other programs that don't pull their residents off of clinical rotations and instead maybe send their preceptor if they're in need of extra help in central pharmacy, or they just work short staff, they call in somebody else. There are a lot of different ways that residents are used in the staffing environment, so I think it would be interesting to see what is actually the best for the residents learning, if that's the true goal. Because a lot of programs look at the resident staffing as an opportunity to take people out of the workflow, which is one of the benefits of having a resident from a financial standpoint within the institution, because ultimately healthcare is a business and people are looking to save dollars and having residents can increase your workload and decrease your productivity in other areas when you're having preceptors spending time doing meetings and teaching, because I can tell you that teaching takes a lot of work. If the data does exist, let me know about the differences in the number of hours of staffing that different pharmacy residency programs do. It would be fascinating to me to see the difference, as well as the outcomes that come from that. Are they getting better positions? Are they doing better on board exams? You know, things that are tangible related to the number of staffing hours that a resident does. The other thing that was discussed in both letters was the amount of non-clinical task and the burden of doing a lot of non-clinical tasks and how that plays on resident well-being. While there are certain programs and types of programs where the residents are coming in with the intention of doing a non-clinical role after graduating residency, many of the residents are going into a residency program with the intent of taking some type of clinical role, whether that's a clinical staffing position, a clinical specialist position, that goal may be different, but ultimately they are looking to care for patients. And a lot of the residency requirements that are out there are non-clinical tasks and they are requirements. And I think they're good requirements because Realistically, as a clinical pharmacist specialist, 
you do a lot of non-clinical tasks. And if you're a clinical staff pharmacist, you do definitely do more patient care and clinical tasks. But there are a lot of other things that you have to do in your career that are non-clinical, such as maintaining CE and doing trainings. But as residents, you're doing a lot of those non-clinical tasks. You're doing presentations. You are doing research. You are also doing meetings that you're required to attend. There are also articles that you're asked to write. You're doing evaluations and surveys. There's just so many things that stack up, and that adds up to a lot of non-clinical time. And studies have shown the more non-clinical tasks that you are doing, the more likely you are to get burned out. And I think not just what's required by the program, but how many are actually getting assigned. And by the end of the year, what does that look like? And how are they stacking up with each other as far as the timeline goes can be really beneficial. As a resident, I did a lot of presentations. So my major ones that hit my CV, there were nine of them. Seven of them were continuing education presentations, some of which I did more than once as far as presenting. And then I had two lectures that I did for the School of Pharmacy. And those, like I said, were just the presentations that reached my CV. I did a lot of P&T presentations, medication safety presentations. I actually had some of those CE and lectures line up to where I had two in one week. And that's a lot of stress and added administrative task, non-clinical task time that was added to my weeks, sometimes when I was on a difficult rotation like ICU. And that's just presentation. So looking at all of the non-clinical tasks that the residents are doing and determining how many do need to be done, because you do need to do multiple presentations in a year so you can see change over time. Is the resident getting better at presentations? And I can tell you by the end of the year, if you looked at my presentation number one and you looked at my presentation number nine on that list, number nine was a heck of a lot better in every aspect, not just how it looked, but my presenting skills as well. And there were benefits to those. But at what point do you say we have seen what we need to see? You have improved your presentation skills well enough that if you presented after this, you could do it competently. And that doesn't just apply to presentations. That was just an example, but this applies to all of those different non-clinical tasks that we are asking our residents to do above and beyond the requirements for ASHP residency accreditation. I think it's great to do additional projects that are very passion-driven by the resident, but doing those at the right time and ensuring that we are picking the right projects for a resident. And I think that would vary likely between different residents as they have different goals and different strengths and weaknesses to look at when you're deciding what kind of presentations and projects they should be doing. I think there are many different ways and correct ways to address residency burnout in order to continue to give an excellent educational experience to residents while also considering their well-being and burnout and resiliency throughout the program. Whether it is implementing something like this where you are monitoring the burnout levels throughout the year or finding some other method that works for your program, I think would be very interesting. But ultimately, I think our goal, if you are listening and you're a pharmacy educator, should be to give the resident the best experience possible where they are walking away and still have a passion for the profession of pharmacy at the end of the day and are educated to take care of patients better. My hope for us as a profession is that we continue to better the resident experience and education that we give them as they exit their residency programs. With that, thank you all for joining me and I will talk to you next time. Bye.